At the end of 1985, Paul Castellano, head of one of the most powerful mafia families in the country, was murdered in downtown New York City. The newspapers raced to cover the event, offering various reasons for eliminating him, but they all agreed on one thing. John Gotti was the new boss of the family. No one would have guessed at the time that Gotti's name would no longer just appear from time to time in the reports of crime journalists, but would occupy the front pages of the leading American publications. John Gotti's face would be on the pages of newspapers and television screens more often than the face of the president for nearly 10 years. Because of him, journalists made a name for themselves. TV channels had high ratings, and government officials that try to put him away made their careers. So, if you're interested in hearing the story of a gangster who can easily compete with Al Capone in terms of popularity, then please welcome John Gotti on the other side of the law. John Gotti was born on October 27, 1940, into a family of John and Fanny Gotti. His father was not a role model family man, providing for his wife and 13 children. Gotti Sr. was unable to hold down a job for a long time and wasted most of his money on gambling, making the family extremely poor. And poverty, as we know, is rarely a reason for family well-being. There was constant shouting and swearing in the Gotti household, both among the parents and between the children. So, it was no surprise that little John preferred to spend most of his time not in his room, but on the noisy streets of his neighborhood, where the realm of Cosa Nostra flourished. All these guys in expensive suits and cool cars had the kind of life young Gotti could only dream of. Basically, it was the only example for him of how to get out of poverty that he had hated since childhood. And at the age of 12, John began to work for the Mafia. He was part of a small group of boys who ran small errands for the local gangsters. Of course, this was not a full-fledged involvement in criminal activity, but rather a kind of messenger's job. Gotti's illegal activities at the time were in no way connected with the Mafia. For the most part, they were petty thefts to make a few dollars. For example, the first evidence of John's violation of the law refers to the unsuccessful theft of a construction mixer in 1954. Gradually, with this kind of earning, Gotti began to grow in scope, and by the time he was 16, when he finally dropped out of school, John was already a member of a local teenage gang called the Fulton Rockaway Boys, who were engaged in shoplifting and car thefts. In this gang, Gotti became close friends with several guys who would later join him in the so-called Bergen team of the Gambino Mafia family. Among the most important are Angela Ruggiero and Willie Johnson, nicknamed Willie Boy. It was Willie with whom Gotti would commit the beating of a man at the request of a local mobster, which would be a factor in his transition in 1957 from being an independent gangster to being a partner of Cosa Nostra. After that, from 1957 to 1961, he was arrested five times for petty crimes, but each time he managed to escape punishment. The law could not catch up with him until 1968. Two years before that, John had started robbing trucks carrying goods from the airport. Many employees of the local airport lived in the same neighborhood where Gotti's crew, led by Captain Gambino Carmine Fatico, was based. And since many of them were not blameless and often owed money to local mobsters, either after gambling losses or because of money loans, they often tipped off trucks carrying valuable cargo, making it a very profitable business. And after one of the such tip-off, Gotti and his associates were caught by law enforcement. One of the employees helped them get into the airport cargo area, where they stuffed their car with women's dresses. Unfortunately for them, on that day, there was a routine inspection at the airport by FBI agents who witnessed what was going on, and Gotti ended up behind bars. John would stay in prison until 1972, and when he got out, he would become a confidant of Carmine Fatico, who, because of the charge, could not conduct business directly. He would be Fatico's eyes and ears on the streets. Around this time, Gotti also met Neil Della Croce, who would become a kind of mentor to him at Cosa Nostra. Della Croce was the second man in the family after Carlo Gambino, and his influence on the streets even led the FBI to consider him the boss of the family for some time. And in 1971, 
1981, the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations named Neal as the most powerful Cosa Nostra boss of his time. The fact that such a man was interested in cooperation with Agati after seeing him helping with the Fatico's business could potentially mean ambitious career prospects and John would never have to think about poverty again. Now, However, because of the suspension of recruiting new members, Gotti wasn't even accepted into the family, and he needed to keep proving his worth in order to join a Cosa Nostra. So, when he was summoned by his boss and ordered to eliminate the murderer of his nephew, Carlo Gambino, Gotti did not hesitate to take the case, because if he was successful, it meant almost 100% entry into the Mafia Brotherhood. The case was very important because the murder of the boss's relative had not occurred during some conflict of any kind. It happened as a result of a kidnapping and after a ransom of $100,000 had been paid. It was a spit in the face of the entire Mafia family, and Della Croce swore to Carlo Gambino to find and kill the kidnappers. And in May 1973, when it was possible to figure out who was behind the case, Della Croce, with Gambino's approval, commissioned John on Gotti to do the hit. This man turned out to be the leader of a small Irish gang named James McBratney. Gotti and two accomplices found him in a bar and, posing as police officers, tried to take McBratney outside, but he resisted. A fight ensued, and the Irish gangster was shot dead right in the middle of the bar. Because of the abundance of witnesses in the bar, and the fact that a man close to Gotti named Willie Johnson was an FBI informant, the police put John Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero on the wanted list for the murder of James McBratney two months later. John managed to elude the authorities for a little over a year, but another tip from Willie Johnson through the FBI helped the police capture Gotti in May 1974 while he was meeting a friend in a bar. Carlo Gambino, in gratitude for Gotti's work, hired for him and Ruggiero, one of New York's best lawyers, named Roy Cohen, who fought for them in court for a year and managed to change the charge from murder to manslaughter, which meant only two years in prison and was even less than what John received after stealing women's dresses. However, despite the short sentence, Gotti, while in prison, missed an event that would have long-lasting consequences in his life. At the end of 1976, Carlo Gambino passed away, and shortly before his death, he nominated Paul Castellano as his successor, effectively splitting the family into two factions. One supported Paul, who became the new boss. The second sided with Della Croce, who remained the junior boss. The first faction consisted of the so-called white-collar workers who, for the most part, made their money from nonviolent crimes. The second was dominated by blue-collar workers who did the lion's share of the dirty work. The first group made more money than the second and hardly got their hands dirty, and Castellano was a prime example of this attitude, which led to the growth of the gap between groups from year to year. Also, a rise of Paul's power was a dash of hope for Gotti, who thought that if Della Croce would become the boss, then John himself, as the man closest to him, would gain more power. The only silver lining from Carlo Gambino's death for Gotti was that Castellano reopened the books and, after his release from prison in 1977, John was officially welcomed into the family. Otherwise, there were no advantages for the blue-collar gangster like Gotti, whose ways of earning money may not be grasped by the new boss, and John could practically forget about the rapid advancement of his career. However, John still had the patronage of Della Croce, who had a very strong influence influence on Paul, and Gotti could have worked quietly, waiting for his time, if only things hadn't suddenly changed. People close to Gotti would soon make a series of mistakes that would take the relationship between the two factions from a state of misunderstanding to a state of cold war and even open conflict. Gotti got out of prison in 1977 and became a member of the Mafia and a captain of the Bergen team. In fact, he was just a temporary acting captain, filling this position for a 70-year-old Carmine Fatico who was once again fighting with the authorities for his freedom. Although Gotti did not like the prefix temporary acting to his captain status, it did not prevent him from feeling like a full-fledged boss in the territory he got. Gotti's chief assistant on Bergen's team was his longtime partner, Angelo Ruggiero. 
His closest circle of subordinates included his brother, Gene Gotti, John Carneglia, Anthony Rampino, and Willie Johnson. Brothers Peter and Richard Gotti were given less important roles. All of these men, as well as dozens of other gangsters who wanted to work in Bergen's crew territory, paid Gotti a percentage of their businesses, which allowed John to forget his personal involvement in robberies and hijackings forever. The captain's status took Gotti from petty criminal to the position of still a petty but a racketeer. He now received a percentage of the profits of local gambling establishments and bookmakers' offices and invested some of his money in underground usury. For the IRS, however, Gotti was an employee of a plumbing and heating firm. But these earnings were clearly not enough for John Gotti, who had followed in his father's footsteps and who, according to his contemporaries, was obsessed with betting, losing tens of thousands of dollars a month. And for a long time, no one could understand where Gotti was getting the money to cover his constantly growing debts and to provide for his wife and children. The answer to this question was very surprising. John, who was constantly saying out loud that he fully supported Paul Castellano's prohibition of the drug trade, did not prevent his cronies from doing such a business and was happy to take a percentage of their earnings. Almost everyone in his inner circle of subordinates in Bergen, whom I have listed earlier, were in involved in either heroin or cocaine trafficking. And, knowing that family officially forbade this kind of earning, it was only a matter of time before John would get into trouble with the higher-ups. The trouble started when, in 1983, several people were arrested on charges of heroin trafficking, including Gene Gotti, John Carneglia, and Angelo Ruggiero. The reason for this was a wiretap recording of Ruggiero's conversations, in which he spoke almost openly about his drug dealings. The arrested were the key people in the team of Gotti, who was fully supported by Della Croce. That's why Castellano, who was concerned about an open confrontation with Neil, was slow to decide on the matter, which by the laws of Cosa Nostra should have turned into a death sentence for John's men. In addition, all the suspects completely denied their involvement in the heroin trade, claiming that the tapes only showed Angelo talking about how to deal with the finances of his recently deceased brother, Salvatore, who did sell drugs but was not connected with the mafia in no way, which removed the question of punishment. And for a short time, this explanation was enough for Castellano, who under pressure from Della Croce, agreed to postpone his decision until the tapes were given to Ruggiero's lawyers and Paul personally reviewed them. Due to legal delays, the tapes did not come into Angelo's hands until 1984, but he immediately came up with a new reason not to hand them over, citing the fact that the tapes allegedly captured conversations on personal, even intimate topics. Once again, Della Croce managed to convince Paul not to give an ultimatum on the matter. Besides, at the same time, Castellano was being charged under the RICO Act, and it was more important for him to avoid jail time. For Gotti, however, the persecution of Paul by the authorities made life much easier. The strategy by which they tried to stall for time in order to figure out how to spare Ruggiero and the others from the death penalty was a lifeline. Just a few things had come together. First, the authorities should put Castellano behind bars. And second, Della Croce, who had one foot in the grave because of his advanced cancer, had to live longer than Paul, was free to continue convincing his boss not to take drastic measures in the drug case. With this outcome, Gotti, who was already beginning to be perceived as Neil's successor, was practically getting the red carpet to the position of family boss. However, things did not go according to plan. In the late summer of 1985, the tape of Ruggiero's wiretaps were made public at a preliminary hearing in his case. And since by this time, some of them had also been admitted to the case against Castellano, Paul's lawyers got a hold of the full recordings and the truth was revealed. The only thing separating Bergen's team from the wrath of the family boss was the support of Della Croce, who was getting worse by the day. And Gotti, realizing the precariousness of his position, decided to retaliate and try to hit before they hit him. Sammy Gravano, Robert DiBernardo, and Frankie DeChico were the first people he brought to his side in the conspiracy against Castellano. Subsequently, Captain Joe Armani joins the conspirators, while consigliere Joe Gallo promises to stay out of the way, pretending to know nothing. 
Also, in the preparatory phase of the conspiracy, Gotti probed the other mafia clans on the matter, and three of the other four New York families did not openly object to Paul's removal, and only the Genovese family might have a problem, since its boss, Vincent Gigante, was on good terms with Paul and had several joint ventures with him. All this reconnaissance and formation of the main core of the conspirators took several months, after which the group proceeded to directly plan the assassination attempt. At first, they wanted to lure and kill Castellano's driver, Tommy Bellotti, tell Paul that he was sick and replace him with Frankie DeChico, who would eliminate Paul. But that plan was rejected because of the fear that Paul would not get in the car with Frankie. Several other ideas were also rejected because of other concerns, one of which was to kill Castellano right in his house. The reason to speed up and finally decide on the assassination plan was the fact that in early December 1985, Neil Della Croce died and Castellano began making steps toward eliminating Gotti just a couple of days later. First, he planned to disband Bergen's team and demote John to a soldier, and after a while, to find a reason to eliminate him. This being the case, the assassination attempt had to be carried out in the shortest possible time, and fortunately for the conspirators, Paul himself told them where and when he could be killed. On December 16, 1985, Castellano would summon Frankie DeChico to a meeting at Sparks Restaurant, which was in an extremely busy downtown Manhattan location. From this moment, they knew the exact time and place where the condemned boss would end up, and all that was left was to think good about what to do next. There were 11 men in the assassination team. Four of them were directly at the place where Paul was coming, and they were the first to pull the trigger, while the others were arranged so that if that four failed, Castellano Delano would be surrounded, and retreating to either side would certainly bump into one of the assassins. In practice, however, no support was needed. As soon as Paul drove up to the restaurant and got out of the car, the four gunmen did their job instantly, killing him and the driver, Tommy Bellotto, and then fleeing the scene before anyone had a chance to realize anything. Once Castellano was eliminated, Gotti could no longer worry about Ruggiero's heroin business and all he had to do was seize the vacant boss position. To do this, he first asked Consigliere Joe Gallo to call a meeting of all the Gambino captains, at which it was made clear to all that the investigation into Paul's murder had already begun and there would soon be another meeting where everyone could put their candidacy for the new boss to a vote. John's second move, which followed immediately after the meeting, was to ask Joe Armani to privately inform every captain that Gotti was going to take the boss's chair for himself, and that if anyone decided to oppose it, the family might be plunged into a long and bloody war. But no one dared to challenge him, and at the next meeting held just a couple of days after the first, Gotti was unanimously elected as the new boss. Frankie DeChico became his deputy, and Joe Gallo remained as consigliere. That's how, just in a few weeks, Gotti got rid of the problems that had plagued him for several years, climbing to the top of the Mafia hierarchy at the same time. However, he will not be able to reap the fruits of his labors in peace for long. Inside Cosa Nostra, a new enemy was already preparing to attack him, and from the outside, the main opponent in the life of John Gotti, called the law, mobilized its forces. The murder of Paul Castellano not only allowed Gotti to solve his problems and make himself the boss of the Gambino family, but was also the starting point after which the lion's share of the New York media focused on his persona. The Sparks incident, as the newspaper called it, had aroused great public interest and dragged John Gotti with it. The newly minted mafia boss was in trouble with the law even before Castellano was shot. Prosecutor Diane Giacalone was building a RICO case against him, and there were also charges against John for beating a man. It so happened that the cases began to be considered in court in early 1986, after the sensational incident, which attracted dozens of journalists to these meetings because they were interested in seeing the new boss. And the Mafia boss didn't disappoint. From his first public appearance in the courtroom in January 1986, Gotti literally grabbed the attention of the press. Journalists are used to gangsters who close their hands and want to escape the limelight as quickly as possible. But on this day, they saw a well-dressed, stately man who looked as if he had stepped off the pages of The Godfather and who happily answered their questions like a real politician. Gotti made his first impression on the media that day. 
which they liked so much, and more and more reporters came to the court with each new session. And John plunged into these rays of fame, only fueled the interest with his sharp remarks and flamboyant behavior. As he himself would later say, it's my audience, let them watch. But he had another audience, which looked at him much more closely, and which was not satisfied with only beautiful speeches. They wanted to understand the actions that they expect from the new boss, and Gotti was well aware of this. John decided to begin his reign by addressing a long-standing rift in the family that had begun in 1976 after the death of Carlo Gambino. First, in January and February 1986, Gotti invited all the captains in turn in order to explain to each of them personally that they were now one family and there should be no disagreements. And then until May, he himself began to visit their social clubs to get acquainted with the local teams. And at first glance, this was paying off. That misunderstanding among people about what was to come, which had formed after Castellano's death, was beginning to dissipate. And it seemed that the family was indeed close to unity. But the feeling was false and only dulled the attention of Gotti, who failed to notice the plot underway. After the shooting near Sparks, no one directly blamed John for what happened, but most understood that he was behind what happened, and at other times, Castellano's murder would certainly have led to a thorough investigation by the commission. But at the time, the bosses were busy fighting the authorities, who, led by Prosecutor Rudolph Giuliani, wanted to shut down simultaneously the heads of all five New York families, having brought charges under the RICO Act back in early 1985. The only representative of the commission who did not make it to the trial was Vincent Giganti, the insane boss of the Genovese family, who was also on good terms with the late Castellano. He was the one who initiated the plot against Gotti, planned to kill two birds with one stone by eliminating him, to avenge his dead friend, and to put at the head of the Gambino people who would listen to his requests. Giganti got Gambino's captain, James Fila, on his side. He promised him support if, after Gotti's murder, he would run for family boss and make another man who had joined the conspiracy named Daniel Marino his captain. Giganti took all the dirty work for himself. Another man who sided with the Genovese family boss was a high-ranking member of the Lucchese Mafia family named Anthony Casso. He was the one who was responsible for the plan to blow up Gotti and De Chico as they were leaving a meeting with Phyla at his social club. However, John, for whatever reason, did not show up for the meeting, and the bomb only struck his younger boss. De Chico died on the way to the hospital, and Gotti was utterly confused about who wanted him dead. But that wasn't the only problem the Mafia boss had to deal with. Two charges were still pending against him, and the trial was in full swing. The first case, which Gotti dealt with rather easily, concerned an assault committed before Castellano's murder. John and another gangster had an argument with a guy on the street and beat him up a little. The same man promptly informed the police, and Gotti and his accomplice were apprehended right on the scene. The man had originally planned to testify, but the uproar over the shooting outside Sparks Restaurant and the articles called Gotti the new boss of the Gambino family made him think twice about whether to do so. And the sudden loss of the brakes on his truck, as well as the tough guys following him all the time, finally changed the mood of the guy, who ended up in court not recognizing Gotti as his assailant, which got John acquitted of all charges. And the next day's newspapers, with the sarcastic headline, I've forgotten, again made a fuss about the Gambino family boss. The second charge, which was much more serious than the beating, could have cost John almost the rest of his life in prison. Prosecutor named Diane Giacalone built the RICO case against Gotti and a few other guys. RICO, in case anyone doesn't know, is a type of prosecution where a person is judged not so much for a specific crime, but for their involvement with a criminal group. It is possible to convict a defendant under RICO if one can prove the violation of two or more federal laws that were committed for the benefit of a criminal organization. 
Whether that person was the boss who gave the order or the executor who carried it out was not so important, and the penalties under RICO were much harsher than the sentencing of an individual for each particular crime. And the most serious thing, which Gotti feared, was that the prosecutor could make up a case out of a person's pre-existing convictions that were treated as individual crimes. In that case, the prosecutor had only to prove that the defendant had not committed them privately, but as a result of a criminal organization. That is exactly what Diane Giacalone planned to do. She already had charges against Gotti for the theft of items from the airport, as well as for the manslaughter of McBratney, both of which were federal crimes, and all she had to do was prove that they had been committed for the benefit of an organization called the Gambino Mafia family. To make matters worse, one of the accused, Neil Della Croce's son, Armand, had pleaded guilty and confirmed in that plea the existence of both the Gambino family and the Bergen crew of which Gotti had previously been a member. It was after this incident when John would make it a rule in the family not to confirm the existence of the family under any circumstances in his confession, as this could hit the boss at any time. This begins the case. It was clear that it was almost impossible to win the trial by legal means, and Gotti decided to choose a tactic he had been familiar with since the beating case. He ordered his men to start intimidating a witness who was supposed to testify on one of the charges. But John's boys clearly overdid it, and instead of solving the problem, they only got an aggravation. This man reported to the police about the persecution, which, coupled with the case, when in the past the witness suddenly forgot what his abuser looked like, allowed Giacalone to demand the cancellation of this very bail at the bail hearing, in view of the high probability of continued intimidation of witnesses. And the judge found her demands reasonable, and sent John to jail, pending the outcome of a trial that could potentially end in a 40-year prison sentence for him. Once behind bars, Gotti appointed Joe Armani to the position of underboss, who replaced the recently murdered Frankie DeChico. He was to be assisted by consigliere Joe Gallo, as well as two captains, Sammy Gravano and Angelo Ruggiero. However, all of them except Gravano were soon in serious trouble with the law, and Sammy was de facto in charge of the family during John's imprisonment. Gravano received instructions from Gotti through his brother Gene, who saw him in prison, and then conveyed to them the people on the streets. Specifically, Sammy and another man named Frankie Lacascio, who would later also hold a high position in Gotti's administration, toured all the Gambino family teams and made it clear how the organization would now be run and how John was going to beat the charges. Though perhaps the phrase, going to get rid of, is not so appropriate in this case for his contribution to the planning of what would eventually enable Gotti to escape punishment was about the same as the flapping of a butterfly's wings that causes a tornado on the other side of the globe. You could tell that freedom had come to him by itself, and the name of the man who allowed John to escape punishment was George Pape. George had been selected as one of the jurors in the Gotti case, but he had no intention of working for justice from the beginning, when he was approved, but only wanted to line his own pockets. Pape was acquainted with the leader of the Irish Westies gang, who in turn had common business with the Gambino family. George contacted his acquaintances and asked if the mafiosi wanted to decide the outcome of the trial in advance. Naturally, when this information reached Gotti, he immediately gave the go-ahead, and $60,000 fell into the disreputable juror's pocket, which he worked off in full. In March 1987, John Gotti was acquitted by a jury on both counts, and those six months of trial were nothing but a farce only to deceive the public. Each time he walked into the courtroom with his head held high, showing that he did not doubt his innocence for a second, or as it will become clear after a while, he does not doubt for a second the final result of the process. 
Gotti's behavior and the way the trial was held, during which the defense no longer denied John's guilt, but tried to discredit prosecutor Diane Giacalone in various ways, drew dozens of journalists to the courtroom, who then turned the court battles into global events with their articles. And Gotti, who spoke to the press through his lawyer, Bruce Cutler, only added fuel to the fire, each time portraying himself as a martyr who has fallen under the system, while trying in every way to make his name associated not with a thug, but with the image of a man who had once been wronged and who is now very different. This whole media circus went so far during the time that the discussion of Gotti's trial was comparable to the way the events of World War II were discussed. Nearly every newspaper and television channel in the U.S., as well as dozens of newspapers and channels from abroad, had correspondents assigned to attend every session. Time magazine even commissioned a portrait of Gotti from the famous artist Andy Warhol and placed it on the cover of one of its issues. Gotti was a real star, like some famous actor, politician, or sportsman. And when he walked out of the courtroom in March 1987 to a standing ovation, it was like honoring a boxer who had just won the world title. But he did not yet know that the next title challenger would be much stronger than the previous one, after spending hundreds of hours training, would knock him out. When Gotti left the courtroom in 1987, he had everything he could ever dream of. He was the boss of one of the most powerful mafia families in the country, and he no longer even thought about poverty. The money he received from his subordinates was enough for everything, to provide for his family, to bet endlessly, and to live the luxurious life of the most popular gangster of his generation. His typical day was a hedonist's paradise. John would get up in the afternoon, drive to the social club, talk with his subordinates there, and at the evening, he would go to a nice restaurant for dinner. After that, he would take his mistress with him and go to one of the nightclubs in New York, where he spent the night. In such places, Gotti was a real star, and famous actors, singers, and athletes were happy to meet him. His friendship with such popular personalities as Mickey Rourke, Anthony Quinn, and John Voight is widely known. And ordinary people approached his table just to shake his hand and tell him they were very happy to meet him. All this indicated that the manipulation of public opinion that had taken place during his first RICO case had gone not just as Gotti had intended, but even beyond his expectations. The media portrayed him as Robin Hood, as a man of the people who could defeat the hated system. And Gotti loved this attention to his person, loved being in the spotlight, as his deputy Sammy Gravano later recalled. John once told them in a restaurant that the people at the next table watching them all night were his audience. Every appearance on the screen or in the pages of the newspapers brought Gotti into rapture. He even hung a magazine cover with his image on it in the social club. However, this behavior of the boss caused some misunderstanding among his subordinates, most of whom thought that Costa Nostra should be in the shadows. John, on the other hand, answered that the publicity in his opinion is the key to winning more easily in courts, because a positive public opinion can have a beneficial effect on the jury's decision. And then he decided to maintain his image by staging mass festivities with fireworks in his neighborhood to celebrate Independence Day. And it must be said that Gotti really succeeded in blowing dust in most people's eyes to make an image for the public that was diametrically opposed to reality. In newspapers, John was a drug-fighting, educated, and intelligent citizen, even though he was involved in some illegal activity, covered his fruits with other mythical acts. In reality, Gotti was a drug dealer and a violent thug who had the blood of more than one person on his hands. And this true identity of John, which most people overlooked, was seen by a small minority of people, some of whom wanted to put him away, and especially ardent advocates of universal justice wanted to kill him. John was undoubtedly popular, and like a star he attracted strangers to him. Some of them came up to him and shook his hand, and some of them were sick psychos who wanted to kill him. Just as famous singers who have crazy groupies who follow them on their heels, Gotti had his lunatics who became obsessed with him. 
The first such fanatic was a man named Jeffrey Ciccone. A month and a half after John won his court case, Ciccone ambushed Gotti outside a social club in Bergen and tried to shoot him. John, however, managed to escape the bullets by running inside the building, and the shooter was caught by other mobsters. When the gangsters began torturing him to find out the name of the customer, Ciccone began to claim that he had been sent to this earth by God, that he had spoken to Jesus, who had told them to kill John Gotti, who was the devil incarnate in human form. The second lunatic who took on the role of never found again Ciccone was Michael McCray. He did not try to shoot Gotti. Instead of that, he planted a bomb near the entrance to the social club. Unfortunately for the fanatic, the device never went off, so he decided in his sick brain that the stakes needed to be raised. McCray wrote a letter to the Catholic Archbishop of New York in which he claimed responsibility for the assassination attempt and demanded a meeting with Gaudi. The Archbishop, of course, sent this letter to the police, who found McCray at the scene of a potential meeting in the Tennessee woods, where he was sitting in a car reading a Bible, surrounded by an arsenal of weapons. Under questioning, he claimed, just like Ciccone, that Gaudi was evil and ridding the world of him was McCray's supreme goal. Less fanatic, but no less determined to rid society of John Gotti, were the law enforcement agencies themselves. The popularity of the Gambino family boss, gained by winning the last trial, was a resounding slap in the face to the state. Plus, John's celebrity status virtually guaranteed a successful career for whoever could put him away. Therefore, the continued prosecution of Gaudi was no longer just another gangster's case, but a personal vendetta by the authorities against a gangster who had decided to put himself above the state. The law enforcement agencies, like runners, competed to see who would be the first to cross the finish line, putting the mob boss away. The FBI, the police, a United States organized crime strike force, and two New York district attorneys all wanted to put Gotti behind bars. The only thing they didn't agree on was the format of their race. Some saw the investigation as a sprint, where they wanted John back in the dock as soon as possible. Others were going to run a marathon, so that by the end of the race, there would be so much evidence that there would be no way Gotti could get away with it. It was somewhat reminiscent of the parable of the competition between the hare and the tortoise. And, as in the parable, in life, the hare will be punished for his self-confidence, and the tortoise will reach the finish line first. The hare in our case is the head of a special organized crime unit named Ronald Goldstock. His group recorded Gotti's conversations at his social club in Bergen in 1985 and 1986. And in these recordings, John babbled about his involvement in the assassination attempt on a union leader named O'Connor. When Goldstock brought these tapes to the Eastern District Attorney named Annie Maloney, asking him to prosecute, he was denied due to insufficient evidence, but Goldstock didn't think so, and renewed his efforts to obtain a trial in 1988, when the same information was confirmed by an Irish gangster named James McElroy, who was a member of the gang directly carrying out the assassination attempt on O'Connor. This time he went not to Maloney, but to Manhattan District Attorney Robert Morgenthau, who was more optimistic and filed the criminal complaint. And in January 1989, John Gotti was taken into custody for the third time in four years. This time he was allowed out on $100,000 bail, so he remained free for the following year while the pretrial proceedings were in progress. The trial itself took place from January to February 1990 and resulted in an acquittal. Maloney was right. The tapes that had been recorded at Bergen and the testimony of McElroy, who had not participated in the attempt but had only heard that his gang had done so at Gotti's request, were insufficient. The defense attorneys were able to discredit both, finally winning over the prosecutors by subpoenaing O'Connor himself, who had survived the assassination attempt and testified in court that he did not know who wanted to kill him and doubted that it could have been Gotti. The sprint tactics of the day had been crushingly defeated, but the marathoners, meaning the FBI agents, who had been monitoring and bugging John's social club called Ravenite for months, were already close to presenting prosecutors with evidence that would be almost impossible to deny. 
This problem, however, was still hidden from Gaudi, but the conflict with Vincent Giaganti, which had already claimed the life of Frankie de Chico, was on the contrary becoming clearer to Gaudi. After that explosion, he still couldn't figure out who was behind it. Not until FBI agents came to his house in 1987 warning him that an attempt on his life was being prepared. The Bureau at the time wiretapped Genovese's family gatherings, and on one of those tapes, mobsters led by their consigliere were discussing a plan to eliminate Jean and John Gotti. The rules required the agents to alert the Gambino family boss, which they did. After this, Gotti, in consultation with Gravano, arranged a meeting with Gigante, where the latter promised to take care of it and guaranteed that there would be no assassination attempt. John, on the other hand, who could not unleash a war where the occasion was the words of FBI agents, was forced to settle for mere promises, which Gigante had no intention of keeping. The Genovese family boss took no action for several years and then killed two guys close to Gotti, named Eddie Lino and Bobby Borriello. Gigante, who had failed to take out John directly, now wanted to weaken Gotti by killing people close to him and then to hit the Gambino family boss himself. Both assassination attempts were carried out in such a way that nothing led to Gigante. And had he continued his tactics further, it is likely that John might have lost this war. But Gigante was overtaken, and it was not for him to defeat Gotti, but for the authorities, who were very well prepared for the fight this time. John, soon after becoming boss, moved his headquarters from the Bergen Social Club to the same place called Ravenite, where the late Neil Della Croce used to be based. Gotti showed up there almost every day and demanded the same regularity from all of his captains, which was like a Christmas present for the FBI agents conducting surveillance. John's whim made everything much easier for the Bureau, which could concentrate all its forces on Ravenite, where there was a maximum concentration of both Gambino family members and the discussion of their illegal affairs. The agents only needed to drop a wire in the right places and then be patient and listen. Initially, when the FBI first began their surveillance, they set up an outdoor surveillance on Gaudi, which consisted of five cars. If John was going somewhere, the car following him was constantly changing. If the agents had to follow him when he stopped, they used tricks such as permanent disguise or a special device that could imitate a broken headlight so that Gaudi would not notice the surveillance. The Bureau followed John for about a month, and during that time, they understood that it was literally possible to compare watches with Gotti. He was so committed to his habits, to be in the same places at the same time. And therefore, there was no particular reason to continue to follow him everywhere. Instead, they decided to concentrate all their forces near the Ravenite, since at the same time one of the informants told them about the order, because of which the captains had to come to the social club almost every day. Ravenite was located in a busy neighborhood called Little Italy, whose residents since the days of Della Croce hadn't been too fond of the authorities and would report local mobsters if they spotted anyone suspicious. This was a problem for the FBI, since outside surveillance would have been immediately uncovered. So, they decided to conduct surveillance remotely with a high-powered video camera. The agents rented an apartment two and a half blocks from the club. In this way, they were able to sufficiently distance themselves from Gotti's loyal locals, who could inform him of unusual photographers, but at the same time, thanks to powerful optics, see everyone who comes and goes. After installing video surveillance, the Bureau decided it would be a good idea to drop a wire as well. Initially, a listening device was installed in Ravenite itself, and then, when one of the dozens of freshly recruited informants informed them that John was having all the important conversations in the apartment above the club, the bug was installed there as well. So, Gotti was surrounded from all sides, and all the FBI had to do was to wait for him to say too much, and they did not have to wait long. The first overheard conversations in the apartment made it clear that John liked to talk not only to journalists and his big mouth, which made him Robin Hood in public, says a lot of wrong words in private. Soon nobody is going to remember the ovation at his ascent. In the apartment above Ravenite, which John used for sensitive conversations, lived the widow of a former member of the Gambino family. Whenever Gaudi needed to talk there, she was simply sent out for a walk. 
At other times, her presence there was a guarantee that no bugs could be planted. So John felt at ease in the apartment, and without fear of anything, he talked about anything. Meanwhile, the FBI found a way to get in and wiretap the place. For the first time in a long time, the authorities were one step ahead of Gotti and exploited his mistakes. John, with his inflated ego, decided that a few court victories allowed him to consider himself invincible and began openly rounding up the family on a regular basis. Agents immediately used video surveillance to identify most of Ravenite's visitors, saving themselves years of operational work. Gotti thought that he outsmarted the Bureau by having important conversations in the apartment of an inconspicuous old lady. But the FBI managed to beat him here, too. Everything he said would be used against him. Gotti would never stop talking whenever he entered his secret hideout. A typical example of John's behavior in his conversation with the deputy, Frankie Lacasio, who had succeeded Joe Armani. Not only it's notable for revealing Gotti's true identity, but it also has several of John's misfires, one of which, not so obvious at first glance and not helping the FBI in any way then, will end up costing him his freedom. As soon as they entered the apartment and all the way out, Gotti was practically the only one talking. John, from the very first words, provided the agents with facts, expanding the evidence against him, naming Lucascio as his deputy, himself as boss, and Gravano, the consigliere, in the conversation, and after a few more minutes mentioning their common involvement in the Cosa Nostra. Afterwards, discussing how difficult it was for him to make difficult decisions in his family and that not everyone was really happy with the state of affairs, he almost confessed to killing Castellano, rhetorically asking, who can challenge me? Who will be able to shoot me like I did the other guy? Then he would suddenly go to the subject of never saying or doing anything behind people's backs. And then he would start discussing Gravano, complaining that Sammy made too much money, comparing him to the late Castellano, who had sold his family for a construction company. Lacasio, on the other hand, offered to bring Gravano here and discuss the matter with him personally, to which Gotti merely said he would do it another time. And instead of talking to Sammy, he continued the same story, but from a different angle. Now John began to say that at any moment he could become a billionaire, but unlike Gravano, he did not seek to make all the money in the world or to become a construction magnate. After finishing his tirade about greed, Gotti complained for another dozen minutes about how hard it was on him, how the whole world was turning on him, and how the authorities, who had then indicted him in the O'Connor case, would stop at nothing to put him away. Then his mood would change abruptly, and he would sing his praises that he could beat off any attacks and would never end up in prison. The Bureau agents had to listen to Gotti's diametrically opposed speeches about the fate of Gotti for quite some time. And only at the end, he gave them more than enough information they needed. John let it slip about who brings him money and how much, and also how he is trying to avoid a lawsuit from the tax service. This conversation alone was enough to bring a new case against Gotti. But the FBI wanted maximum evidence, so they kept listening. And their decision turned out to be 100% correct. Later, John would have several more conversations about his involvement in the Cosa Nostra, would discuss taking new members into the family, and most importantly for the authorities, he would openly confess to three murders and his involvement in illegal gambling. As the cherry on the cake, Gotti's recordings reveal his contacts with the police, as well as his longtime lawyer's involvement with the Gambino family, which would later lead to his removal from the case. Now the FBI agents had enough evidence to go with to the prosecutor and ask him to make the case. However, it turned out to be a little more complicated than they thought. The Bureau brought the fruits of its labors to the Eastern District Attorney, and at the same time the Southern District Attorney, who was handling the murder of Paul Castellano, had a high-ranking mobster named Phil Leonetti as a witness, who could confirm that John told them about the planning of the assassination in a private conversation. 
and since putting Gotti in jail at the time was a huge boost to the reputation, there was a real fight over the case. Both sides argued that they should be the first to bring the case, and no one wanted to cede that right. The parties were so stubborn that a higher authority had to intervene. They decided to put forward a joint case under RICO law, combining the evidence of both sides. And once the legal delays were eliminated, the FBI immediately received the go-ahead to arrest the Gambino family administration, represented by Gotti, Gravano, and Lacasio. The agents decided to do it in Ravenite when they all got together. The only complication was that Gravano disappeared for a while, briefly delaying the long-awaited apprehension. The plan was for Sammy to go on the run on Gotti's orders. But then plans changed. He returned to New York and on December 10, 1990, arrived at a meeting in Ravenite, where, along with Gotti and Lacasio, he was immediately detained by FBI agents. They were charged and escorted to jail, where the trio would remain until John's fatal bail hearing. On December 21, 1990, in the courtroom, tapes of Gotti's conversations in the apartment over Ravenite will be heard, where, among other evidence, his accusations against Gravano will be heard there. In addition to the complaints about greed that I described above, there were also accusations that Sammy had literally forced Gotti to give orders to eliminate people, which was the first straw for Gravano's further betrayal and his conversion to government witnesses. If you want to know more about what motivated Sammy to switch to the other side of the barricades, you should watch a video about him, which I also have on my channel. In short, Gravano, hearing the tapes, realized that it could be used to pin the blame on him. And Gotti, who in the minds of the masses was a kind of Robin Hood, could get away with making Sammy look like a bloody psychopath, ungovernable, and pin the murders on him. This thought, which had crept into Gravano's mind at the bail hearing, had been germinating in his mind for a little less than a year and bore fruit on October 24, 1991. By that day, he had clearly decided that he was not going to do time because his boss had talked too much, and he offered his services to the FBI as a witness himself. For Gotti, this meant that the only way to win the case was another manipulation of the public mind. And this time, the media circus was played out with a special scope, where even the most insignificant benefactors immediately flew into the pages of the newspapers. As always, there were speeches from people speaking on John's behalf about the unfairness of persecution and about the state's obsession with John Gotti for no apparent reason. And any good Gotti's deed was immediately reported to the press. A dog was stolen from a terminally ill child. John found out about it and ordered a new one to be given to him. The story is immediately in print. A very valuable urn for religious services was stolen from a church. Gotti's people immediately found contacts on television and told that John has already told his boys to do the search. Also, celebrities he knew were invited to the court sessions to support Gotti. Celebrity supporters included heavyweight boxer Ronaldo Snipes, civil rights leader Roy Innes, singer Jay Black, and actors John Amos, Al Lewis, Mickey Rourke, and Anthony Quinn. And around the court, in addition to the dozens of journalists who came from every corner of the globe, were hundreds of ordinary people who stood with placards and shouted words of support for John Gotti. There were negative rumors about the main witness, Gravano. The image of a gay drug addict with an uncontrollable craving for violence could stick to him. As soon as Sammy began to testify, it became clear that Gotti was no longer immune from prison. Gravano told of all John's illegal activities, all the murders he had ordered, and how he had come to power by eliminating Paul Castellano. This testimony, as well as the records obtained from Ravenite, was enough to convince the jury of its verdict of guilty on all counts. But even when it seemed that John had lost, that he would never see freedom again, having received the life sentence today, Gotti still gave a performance that no one before or after him had ever repeated. A crowd of about a thousand people gathered outside the court for the final hearing. Most of them were from the area where Gotti did his business and came and rented buses. As soon as word got out that John had received a life sentence, the crowd, incited by a few people with loudspeakers, began chanting, Free John Gotti! And after that, they started hitting police cars, what eventually escalated into a clash with the authorities and a kind of local riot. 
Even when nothing could be fixed anymore, Gotti still continued to play to the public, and this spontaneous riot was like the last flash of John Gotti's star, like a perfect reflection of his personality and his whole story, which could actually fit into one sentence. He was willing to destroy everything around him just to be in the spotlight. He went to prison in 1992 and was locked in solitary confinement, deprived of much needed attention. He was left only with visits from relatives and hundreds of letters that came to him from all over the world, from people who at one time were fascinated by him. Although John tried to keep himself in shape by doing physical exercises and reading books, he still gradually began to fade in such conditions. And in 1998, he was diagnosed with throat cancer, which made him unable to speak at the end of his life. This is symbolic because it was the love of talking that first raised him to the top and then dropped him from there. John Gotti died in a prison hospital in June 2002. This was the story of John Gotti, a story that is the clearest example of what happens when a thug suddenly decides to shine under the spotlight.